I need to introduce Hassan Radwan, my friend, who I've known him for about 15 years. Uh, journey, he does travel far. <laughs> he comes back and uh, explore various stuff. Um, he's a spent teacher. He's been a teacher for 15 years uh, as a teacher in Islamic primary school in London. Uh, he's written four books for children of Muslim parents, and he's leading an Islamic circle. After going through a period of questioning and doubting his faith, first identified himself as an ex-Muslim, that's when I first saw him and met him, uh, he eventually come to identify as agnostic Muslim and campaigns for radical reform within Islam. Um, he has uh, various Facebook groups in support of uh, people who are questioning, they are ag agnostics, or they are, there's a lively debate on his Facebook and, uh, and the blog. Um, he's a member of Inclusive Mosque Initiative in London. On that note, can I welcome um, Hassan Radwan and the panel to discuss identity politics, communalism, and multiculturalism. Thank you. Sorry, I thought because I thought we were one down. <laughs> oh, be I'm so sorry. sorry. Okay. <clears throat> right. Um, I would just like to uh, quickly introduce um, the panel. Um, you've, you've got the full buyers because I, I would like to crack on. Um, I've got Gita Sa um, Zagal on my right, um, if you don't mind, could I, could I quickly borrow that? <laughs> Who is the director of um, the Center for Secular Studies, um, um, Secular Space. Um, I've got Peter, Peter Tatchell, well-known human rights campaigner. Um, I've got Zainab Ghazawi, a Moroccan-born writer, um, and used to be uh, a journalist at Charlie Hebdo. And on my left, I've got Gona Said, the co-founder of Kurdistan Secular Center. And the far left, I've got Kenan Malik, author and broadcaster. Um, I want us to, to crack on so we can have um, a lot of time for questions. So I'm just going to ask everyone just to um, share their opening thoughts on the subject for today, uh, identity politics, communism, and multiculturalism. And if I may start with Kenan. Thanks, Hassan. It's an honor and pleasure to be here, um, back here. Um, and I think I've drawn a sh short straw in being the first to speak on this issue. So it's one of these kind of complex, really difficult issues. But I've been a, a critic of um, identity politics for more than 20, 25 years now. It's kind of, I can barely think about when I first started. Um, and it's become a, a much more uh, fierce issue now than it was um, when I first started thinking about it. And increasingly, I'm hearing two kinds of arguments in, in support of identity politics. First, says all politics is identity politics. We all have identities, um, and all politics is, is, is rooted in them. And the second says identity politics is simply the defense of women's rights, gay rights, struggle against racism, minority rights, and so on. And so to put the, the discussion in some kind of context, I, I want to take those two arguments up. Um, and, to, and in doing so, to reaffirm my critique of, of, of identity politics. Historically, the roots of identity politics go way back back to 
the end of the 18th century, the, the origins of modern politics, the origins of the distinction between left and right. <coughs> Nobody talked about identity politics then, but the first identity politics was that of the reactionary right. That's where it begins. Identity politics begins with racism and nationalism. Radicals define themselves in opposition to such ideas. In opposition to such ideas by promoting the notion of universal rights, of universal values, the idea that all people best flourish under a common certain system of uh, uh, politics, of government, <coughs> of institutions, and so on. And all the great um, movements, struggles for social transformation of the past 200 years, from the, 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 the now forgotten but hugely important uh, Haitian Revolution, led by uh, 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 Louverture in, in the 1790s, through the anti-colonial, anti-imperialist struggles, through the struggles for uh, women's rights, gay rights, through the anti-apartheid struggles, were all based not on a narrow sense of identity, but on the idea that of universal rights and universal values and a common system of institutions and governance. In the post-war world, however, the, um, the whole relationship between politics and identity changed. The old politics, the reactionary politics of identity um, faded away in, in, in the, in the um, wake of Nazism, the Holocaust, it was much more difficult to, to express those kind of the, the, the intense racist identity politics of the past. But a new form of identity politics developed, that of the left, largely because the left, or many sections of the left, had ignored questions of oppression, questions of women's rights, questions of racism and so on, questions of gay rights. Um, and so movements such as the uh, Black Power Movement, the Black Struggles, uh, the, 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 the Black Power Movement in, in America became a, um, a kind of template for many on the left to define um, one's struggles in terms of one's identity, in terms of one's um, uh, particular ideals and goals. Back in the 60s, these struggles were progressive. They were a demand that the left takes these issues seriously and a challenge to oppression and to discrimination. Over time, though, largely as those old social movements and those social struggles have disintegrated. The politics of identity has become largely, uh, has become much narrower and the recognition of identity has become a, an issue in itself. And this has become highly problematic because what it has meant is that rather than attaching specific struggles to broader struggles for um, social transformation, they've become a, 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 an attempt to privilege certain groups, certain identities, certain cultures, certain um, institutions. And the real people who, who, who gain in this are not women or gays or minority groups, but those within those communities who take on themselves the, 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 the claim that they represent those communities, they represent those identities, um, and they become gatekeepers to those communities and identities and cultures. And so community leaders, <clears throat> those who call themselves the authentic voices of these communities present themselves 
as the people who are the voices of those communities. And rather than struggle um, for, uh, uh, for, for, for more universal rights and universal values, what we have now is a struggle for difference, for the privileging of difference, um, and, and the fragmentation of those old struggles. Um, the uh, the African-American uh, academic and um, uh, activist, Adolf Reed, makes this point very, very well when he says that from the perspective of identity politics, it doesn't matter if 1% of the world own 50% of wealth, so long as that, of that 1%, 50% are women, and 20% are blacks, and so many percentage are Muslims and gays and so on. And that kind of fundamentally, um, uh, to me, shows the problems with, 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 with the whole approach. So it's not that all politics is identity politics. We've come to see all politics as our identity politics because the old struggles for, for, for transformation, the old ideas about universal values and universal rights have become eroded. And the real people who gain from this are not... Um, or, or the, 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 the question about fighting for... Um, women's rights and for gay rights and for minority rights, if it's left to the custodians of identity politics, will mean that they, those custodians have the power and the rest of us don't. And you can see this in the struggles around questions of Islam, questions of um, uh, blasphemy, questions about cultural appropriation and so on. And you can also see it in the way that the reactionary ideas of, 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 of um, identity have now come back into the frame. So now you have the rise of anti-immigrant groups and anti-Muslim groups framing themselves in terms of their identity. White nationalism has become their identity. And so you have liberals who defend white nationalism on the grounds that it is simply the identity politics of particular groups of people. And the end point of identity politics is that racism becomes rebranded as a form of identity. I think that, above all, is why we should reject identity politics. We should challenge the core ideas and reframe the way we think about what it means to struggle for equality and justice. Thanks. Thanks, Kinen. Um, I shouldn't say this, but I couldn't help thinking of um, Citizen Khan, uh, the community leader, <laughs> when you mentioned community leaders. Um, Ghana Said, would you like to share your thoughts? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to start, I mean, thank you, Kinan, for all that great insight into what identity politics uh, represent. Uh, maybe not to all, but to some. Um, I'd like to start by talking about ISIS a little bit, um, the Islamic State. Um, you know that in Iraq and in Kurdistan, we face uh, a war. We faced a war with ISIS. I hope that you had the toast for the collapse of ISIS as an organization in the past month. So um, hopefully they are gone for now. Um, um, and, and that you have celebrated that. To me, I mean, when I think about identity politics, I think of ISIS as one of those identities. And it might be controversial. Some people might not like that, of course. Identity politics, there are many people who are marginalized, who are vulnerable, who are disadvantaged. And of course, very rightly, they are fighting for rights. But ISIS also has been one of those identities that have been created uh, from the same philosophy. Um, so ISIS is, is the great example, is the great example of what religion means when it has power in this world, in today. What they did, the atrocities, the massacre, the genocide of Yazidi people, of all the people, the killing of gay people, the stoning of women on the public squares where they had power, 
Um, to me, it means imposing um, the ideology they represent, imposing the Sharia law they want to bring upon everyone in this world, not only on the area they have power in. And also they had influence, we have to admit to that. They did have influence over many of young people in the world, around the world. ISIS, um, it's almost like the robot created from Islam. Like we go around and say Islam represent peace and it represent this. And of course, to many people, maybe it represent peace and all that. However, when you use religion as a tool, as a power, as a tool of power, that's what you get. You get ISIS. And talking about um, how many versions of Islam are there in the area I am representing, like around Iraq, in Iraq, in the Middle East, um, how many identities these different versions of Islam could create? And I could just bring you a few examples from Iraq. You have Shia, you have Sunnah. Uh, of course, we have the Kurdish people, as a, that's a national identity. Um, there is also that. You have the Wahhabis. You have so many different, and of course, we have all the other religion minorities. You have the Yazidis, you have the Shabak, you have the um, Safain. Many of them, each with their different identity. In Iraq, what really created the division, I think, is the politics of identity. It's a constitution in Iraq that led by the West, like led by America, based on that division of identity. What it brought with it is conflict, is war, is ISIS, generated ISIS. What happened is Shia, minor, Shia uh, people in Iraq were oppressed for many, many years. That's why I'm, I keep on t go, t going back to that identity issue. They were oppressed for many, many years under a Sunni ruling of Saddam Hussein, of dictatorship. When they had power in 2003 and onward, they became the oppressor of Sunni people. So Sunni people became the oppressed group with that identity, with that right to influence and to talk and raise their voices. Then Sunni people created ISIS. That situation created ISIS. So what I'm trying to do is how many identities we are going to create amongst people. And we as secularists and atheists in Iraq, in the Middle East, are the losers of all these po uh, political identities. Why we are the losers? Because a person like me, which are thousands of people like me, we have so many identities. We are human rights activists, we are women rights activists, we are LGBT activists, we are atheists, we are uh, non-believers, we are ex-Muslims, we have all these identities. But so many Islam identities are there for millions of people. Somebody could be Muslim Brotherhood, many people could be ISIS, many people could belong to Shia, many people could belong to Sunnah. That power, it's always going to be there. We got rid of ISIS, another version will come up. Because we live in a world, in, in a place where identity comes out every day. A different version, a different group, a different power. And at the end, what happens is it is being supported by, um, by the um, political power. So it is a political economy issue to me. Um, the last thing I want to say, just to give you an insight about, a little bit about where Iraqi Kurdistan stand, stand from all these divisions in the area. What happens in Iraqi Kurdistan is people are mostly identified by their nationality. And that's because of the long historical oppression on Kurdish people. Uh, their ethnicity, their national, their ethnicity as Kurdish, it makes, if you ask any Kurdish person, they will tell you I'm Kurdish. They wouldn't tell you I'm Muslim. They wouldn't tell you I'm Sunni. They wouldn't tell you I'm Shia. It doesn't kind of make sense for them so much. That's, I'm talking naturally. However, we have had 25 years of, um, what they call self-ruling Kurdish parties, which unfortunately they imposed, they brought, they generated, doctorated Islamization of the whole area. Because these political powers are supported either by the Iran Shia or the Turkish Sunnah or the Saudi Sunnah. 
and they will have to, at the end, go with this politics, go with this kind of interest that they have. Now, what happened for secularists like us in Iraqi Kurdistan <coughs> is we are facing those identities that are being brought to the, uh, to the society. People want to live in a secular place, in a secular space. They want better education, they want good health, they want uh, a better life for their children and for themselves. And if, you, if I could have the opportunity to show you photos from how young people live, how secular people, how city people live in Iraqi Kurdistan, you will see that we are trapped amongst a fire of religion, religious division in, around us. And you have also, you are all heard about the fight of ISIS that at the hands of the Kurdish uh, women and men. They were the biggest force defeating ISIS in that area. So to me, I will, I will finish by saying that secularism, one identity, going back to the universal human right, I would say is the answer to all these different divisions of identity around us. For example, a place like Iraq could only come to peace and finish those conflict and violence if there is one version of human rights, if there is one version of citizenship and equality. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gunnar. I'm also going to apologize for messing up the order which, which we agreed beforehand. So I'm going to go now to, to Gita, please. Okay. No, last. Oh, why don't you go to Zainab? Oh, oh, Zainab, okay. <laughs> Done it again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, um, as you introduced me, I am, I'm Moroccan born, but I'm going to talk about France, where I live and uh, work. Um, but uh, I want to start by quoting Faraj Fouda, this uh, intellectual, um, Egyptian intellectual, <coughs> who was uh, assassinated in the 90s in Egypt by the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, in his book, um, in his book, Hiwar uh, Hawl al Dialogue about Secularism, he was giving an example of uh, how uh, the, the Islamists used to consider a democracy at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, he was talking about the parliamentary uh, elections in Egypt. And um, uh, one of the candidates was um, evicted from the election because his competitor, who was an Islamist, a, conser a, conser a conservative, uh, said uh, in all the mosques he could visit, but this man, is a democrat, and people were like, oh, he is democrat, this is kufr, this is apostasy. So this is how actually the Islamists used to consider democracy at the time. Nowadays, only a few of them still recognize that in reality, they consider that democracy is kufr, it is apostasy, because it's the law set by uh, people while we only have to apply the law of God. Uh, but as you know, um, uh, the Islamists are very, um, 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 I mean, they, they have an, an incredible talent to uh, uh, use notions and concepts they haven't created for their own interests. Who knows, maybe one day they will talk about secularism and even gays and uh, LGBT rights uh, to, to pretend that they are defending those rights, but only to, to, uh, to empty them from their sense and their meaning. So I, I was quoting uh, Faraj Fouda because today all the Islamists, and in France uh, particularly, they talk about democracy. But how do they describe democracy? For them, Democracy is uh, the rule of the majority, uh, isn't, isn't it? But actually, uh, I would like to remind that democracy was invented by the Greek. And the Greek, while they invented democracy, they also had another notion that a very few people know. And this notion was called oclocracy. Oclocracy, you can spell it O-C in French, uh, O-C-H-L-O. C -R, uh, R A T uh, I E. 
And ochlocracy means something like, something we can translate as the reign of the vulgar, uh, because actually the majority isn't always right. Let's give an example. Let's, for instance, think, uh, uh, let's take the question of the uh, LGBT rights, and let's take any uh, Islamist theocracy today and uh, make a referendum about uh, gays and lesbian rights uh, in, uh, in those countries, actually, I can guess that more than 95% uh, of the population will say those people are sick people, they have to be killed or at least jailed. <laughs> but is that democratic? It's, it is what the majority will certainly choose, but it is not democratic. This is what we call ochlocracy. Actually, democracy is something else. Democracy is, before everything, is, I mean, f first of all, is to uh, secure human rights, individual freedoms, uh, minorities, um, uh, I mean human rights in their uh, universal uh, uh, meaning, uh, rights of minorities, freedom of faith, equality between men and women, and the day where the Islamist parties will accept that, the day where, where they will accept to have constitution securing those rights and those freedoms and respecting the other minorities, only, only this day they will become, for me, a uh, normal uh, political actor, maybe like the Christian Democrats in some European countries, but until they don't uh, recognize those rights, they can't be considered as a democratic actor of the society. And, uh, and so this, um, this brings us to actually what they consider as uh, what, as democratic, was the, what they consider as a um, democratic majority is either an ethnic majority, majority, religious or racial majority. In, in that case, it's a religious majority. And we know that that kind of majorities, religious, ethnic or racial, among history, that kind of majorities Sometimes it has uh, led to genocides in some countries. So it is very dangerous and it is very important for, for all of us not to fall in the trap set by the Islamists when they talk about democracy. And actually this brings us to communalism. It is what we call communautarism in, in France. It is um, a word that is uh, very frequent in the public debate in France people are uh, against or uh, for communautarism, etc. Communautarism is the proof that uh, even when the, the Islamists pretend to be democrats, when it comes to their own interests, they can make exceptions to the rules of the democracy, how, even how they describe it themselves. For instance, now in France, since Nicolas Sarkozy, and actually it was a very, very a big mistake done by Nicolas Sarkozy, who opened uh, something that we, we, we're still failing to, to get rid of now. He named what, uh, what we call représentant communautaire, uh, com com commun community representants from the Muslim uh, cult, the Islamic cult, etc. And he organized uh, the, the Islamic cult in France. So actually those guys, because they are guys actually, I'm sorry, but uh, there is no woman among, uh, between them. Those guys who pretend to be uh, representative of the Muslim, of the Islamic cult or the Islamic community, actually they are auto-proclaimed uh, representative because in a democracy, in a genuine democracy, the only mechanism of representation is the election. 
and no one have elected those guys, so they only they represent themselves. But it was um, <clears throat> a really a failure and a mistake of the French state to give credit to those guys and consider them as, uh, as uh, uh, representatives and consider them as a part of the public debate. And this is one of the mistakes, I mean, this is a mistake that had consequences later after the, the, the rule of Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, so, um, uh, by, by accepting that kind of representativity, actually we are, um, France is choosing a multiculturalist uh, um, model. This multiculturalism, actually, it's a very beautiful word. When, when, when someone, when one hear, when we hear about the, this word the first time, we just imagine it's something beautiful, multiculturalism. You know, it's uh, the mixity. It's, I mean, different cultures, different musics, costumes, etc. Just something beautiful. But actually, it's not that at all. It's something completely different. It is. Uh, um, um, it is a society where different ghettos live together but without communicating. And actually, no one has a problem with having different cultures in the same society, but the problem is uh, when, when the people belonging or identifying their, themselves as belonging to those cultures want uh, different rights, uh, want uh, specific rules, want um, exceptions to the general law in the name of their culture. And actually, um, the political power, um, either from the left or from the right, who encourage that multiculturalism in France, actually, their main argument is not being racist. But I describe this kind of multiculturalism exactly as racism. What is racism? Racism is the fact to say, we as white, we are for freedom. We are for equality between men and women. We are for sexual freedom. But you know what? We are going to leave those people do it differently. <laughs> This is the definition of racism, and we have to keep it in mind and remember it every time we talk to someone who talks about multiculturalism as uh, an approach, as an anti-racist approach. Actually, it's a trap, and don't fall in that trap, please. <laughs> Well said, Zainab. Thank you so much for that. Um, can I come to you next? <laughs> Thank you. And Gita. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm very excited to be here because there are things that this conference is discussing which have been deemed uh, outside the framework uh, of human rights and uh, sometimes outside the framework of human rights protection or the protection even of activists arguing for human rights. Um, one of those issues is the title of the conference, it's a secularism conference, and there's a great deal of nervousness in many of the formal human rights organizations and some of the UN bodies about whether um, secularism uh, is, it should, deserves any kind of protection, whether it's even consistent with human rights. And when, when I founded the Center for Secular Space, I was told by friends and allies, this is a really bad name. It is too controversial. Don't call yourself secular. Uh, you know, can't you bury it by saying you're for you know, women's rights or something? And I said, yes, we are obviously for women's rights, but we're taking our feminist ideas of women's rights into the fight for secularism and against religious fundamentalism. And uh, uh, of course, our friends and allies were quite right. Uh, the people who were funding um, the uh, big human rights organizations and sometimes funding the Al-Qaeda networks like Gage that they supported uh, were never, ever going to fund us, even though they supposedly stood for social justice and so on. So um, 
it's really important to have that this conference, and it's important to discuss, as we have done, in ways that are sometimes uh, quite difficult for people, the connections between um, various kinds of religious identities and progressive identities versus um, other ones. And one of the things that people have said, which I wholly heartedly agree with, is, uh, I mean, I agree with everything the panelists have said before, um, uh, that the issue of multiculturalism is, is, it's not about whether a society should or shouldn't be diverse, but it, it, it has been used as a very regressive social policy. And I'm glad Zainab mentioned France because sometimes people think it doesn't exist in France, but we know that the leaders have been using the same tactics, which are much more developed and embedded over here in Britain. And it also applies to another uh, country that I wish to talk about, which is India, which is, um, a secular democracy, which is one of the most plural countries in the world, but which unfortunately has followed similar policies of multiculturalism, some of them inherited directly from colonialism, which is a system of personal status laws, separate laws for different communities. And that entrenches that community division. And what it means, and it's meant this across South Asia, is that the majority manages to reform its laws because there are feminists who can argue within the majority community that we must have reform. So after independence, you had the reform of Hindu, uh, uh, Hindu personal laws. So you brought in ended polygamy, brought in divorce by mutual consent long before it was uh, brought in in, in uh, Western countries and various other reforms. They weren't perfect, but they were a huge step forward. In Pakistan, in the 60s, there was a reform of Muslim personal law. Uh, but the personal laws of the minority never got reformed in the countries where they were the minority, precisely because of a version of, we didn't call it multiculturalism, but it's a form of politics that is seen as protective of democracy because it protects minorities, but it protects their group identity and denies their individual rights. And that is written into what is a secular constitution. And in India, actually at independence, the Dalits, a great Dalit leader called Ambedkar, Dalit being the people who are most outcast, so they're uh, considered outside the fold of uh, caste Hinduism. Um, but one of the lawmakers who, who drafted the constitution was a Dalit, and he said that we are, have this independence in order to challenge religion and caste and all these things. It was not just fighting the British Empire in order to establish a regressive identity. It was a transformation, which Gona was talking about in terms of the Kurdish struggle now, but that was a struggle that happened in India, which is a very conscious transformation of the Indian um, struggle for uh, independence, that it was only the first step in liberation. Political independence was a first step in liberation because social justice, social, the social liberation, the ending of caste and class distinctions, um, and uh, uh, this basis of religious identity uh, was there, it was discussed. But because partition had happened, India had been divided into India and Pakistan, and immense violence perpetrated by religious fundamentalists uh, and others on both sides, um, that didn't go through. So the, you know, the, what's called the uniform civil code, the idea that there should be one civil code to cover everybody remained in the directive principles of the, of, of the Constitution. But in order to, as it considered to protect Muslims, the Congress decided, which is the party in power and the party that had fought for independence, decided they couldn't push the idea of a uniform code at that time. And to this day, we therefore don't have one. And there's struggles going on now of Muslim women to reform Muslim law, but the only basis on which they can argue it is the limited basis that they reform it within, <coughs> uh, within their religious tradition. Um, but they demand the protection of the court, the Supreme Court, in order to do that. And that is a complex problem because, of course, the fundamentalist leaders are saying, we don't recognize the Supreme Court. They recognize it to protect their rights when they're attacked as Muslims, but they don't recognize it. It's, you know, they don't want to recognize its jurisdiction over uh, uh, reforming or transforming personal law. We also now have in power a government which I see uh, uh, as the equivalent of the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think it's one of the really significant things discussed at this conference unlike the entire narrative of all the think tanks dealing with counterterrorism and extremism and so on outside, 
most of which look at the Muslim Brotherhood as a moderate organization. Because every time something worse comes along, their, their narrative moves a little further to the right. So at uh, the heart of the Syrian war, I think there were even a few saying there's some good bits of Al-Qaeda and there's a lot of stuff that the uh, Saudis went to to split one form of Al-Qaeda from another and you know, which parts they would back in the rebel movements and so on. So everywhere, on every panel, we have heard that the Muslim Brotherhood is a major problem. And the Hindutva movement, which was born at a very similar time, in the pre-independence period, uh, uh, not that distant from another organization called the Jamaat-e Islami, which is a Muslim fundamentalist organization, um, has now taken power in India in majority rule. I mean, they, 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 they don't have to defend on coalition government anymore. It took them many years to do that in a very plural country, in which, which is also one of the largest Muslim countries in the world, which many people don't realize. Um, and they want to eventually end the secular constitution. They cannot do it immediately. So like the Muslim Brotherhood, they're willing to undermine it bit by bit. They, in the past, have launched pogroms and attacks on people on the basis of their political identity, of their, of their, of their religious identity, on Muslims, on Christians. And one of the things they learned from the mass pogroms, like in Gujarat, in Western India in 2002, is that there was a huge reaction from the in Indian human rights activists, but also the international community. And the chief minister of Gujarat at that time, Narendra Modi, who's now the, the um, prime minister, uh, he was denied a visa by the UK, the US, and so on, partly as a result of activist organizing for many, many years. In fact, until he became prime minister. Um, because that he was in charge at the time that there was a state-backed uh, attack on Muslims in Gujarat, which killed at least 2,000 people and uh, 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 displaced uh, uh, about 100,000. But because there was a human rights response to that, uh, and, and there have been some cases, one in court and so on, which is very unusual because most, cr the bigger the crime, the less result you get in court normally. But there have been some cases, one in court. What they're now doing is organizing um, uh, I mean, not directly, the, the, the political party which has nothing to do with us, but they're vigilante mobs going around lynching people for various reasons. So one of the reasons is that they say, we Hindus are, uh, think the cow is our mother, it's a sacred animal, and so on. And therefore, and this is an old uh, message that, uh, that some Orthodox Hindus have had. There have been many anti-cow slaughter campaigns. But now, what, what is new is that they will lynch people they deem to be beef eaters. And of course, those people are Muslims. Actually, uh, large numbers of Indians eat beef. One of, one, it's a huge attack on the poor, among other things. It's an attack on Muslims. It's an attack on the poor because a lot of people eat beef because it's, uh, or buffalo because it's one of the cheapest meats in India. Um, but none of this is to do with animal rights. So if any of you are animal rights supporters, this is not about protection of animals. It's about attacking other people on the basis of supposedly being beef eaters. Uh, they also are killing rationalists in individual assassin assassinations in exactly the same ways as are going on in um, uh, Muslim countries where fundamentalists are. So assassination squads uh, coming and killing individual rationalists at their door. So there are a whole, there's a very violent atmosphere being created. Now you come to Britain and Modi is considered a partner in the war on terror, uh, a, a, a country to, you know, which might bring investment to Britain and which perhaps uh, Britain can trade with if they can find anything that, to tradable with India um, and so on. Uh, and there are Hindutva people who have influence in parliament and in the cabinet, so within, uh, within the conservative cabinet but also in the Labour Party. Because this is a point I want to make and I really want everybody to hear it, that we've heard a lot and it's absolutely true that the left is involved with promoting and protecting Islamists. The left doesn't generally protect Hindutva. I mean, Corbyn was, was attacked on the right because he failed to attend uh, a laudatory meeting when Modi came to parliament, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and I think that's actually one of the good things uh, Corbyn did was to keep away from that meeting. Uh, but it's been used as, as, as one of the attacks on him. The other thing that nobody has really seemed to have noticed, well, recently there's been a lot of discussion about the British government 
failing to re uh, release a report on extremism that looked at Saudi Arabia and the influence of Saudi Arabia in Britain uh, and, and Saudi Arabian money. And they produced a ridiculous few pages which said absolutely nothing um, because we, I think anybody who's looked at it believes it would be extremely embarrassing because whatever it revealed would not only reveal Saudi Arabian funding, but government funding for various institutions which are Islamist institutions. So for instance, the East London Mosque, which is a Jamaate Islami dominated mosque, uh, Jamaate Islami being the South Asian brother organization of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, was considered an ally, particularly under the Labour Party, under Tony Blair, uh, of, uh, to, to, particularly uh, as uh, Zainab said, to this, this uh, approach of appointing community leaders, they went from a minority community leader to specifically choosing fundamentalist community leaders to work with. And I believe this was a deliberate policy. I think there's growing evidence, if you look for it, of a deliberate policy of excluding secular Muslims or other advisors, uh, uh, and particularly secular Muslim women, and putting at the table of uh, the police and uh, government and so on, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Jamaate Islami, and various other Islamist groupings. And that was in spite of public evidence of war crimes that individuals had committed and which the party continued to support in principle as a just war in the Bangladesh war. And what's really clear to me is when the government has made comments on extremism and fundamentalism, they have never used a human rights approach. They have never talked about human rights violations because they're too busy attacking human rights protections. But human rights protections don't only apply to jihadis that the human rights movement has embraced as human rights defenders. They also apply to the people who are fighting against fundamentalist oppression uh, and, and need to use the Human Rights Act and other acts in order to highlight it. The government has not wanted to talk about uh, uh, the violations that the Jamaat-e Islami and the Muslim Brotherhood continue to commit. They've never had published a report examining the Jamaat-e Islami as such. They published a ridiculous one on the Muslim Brotherhood where they suppressed most of the information, brought it out at Christmas when no one was noticing, and the whole thing was buried. So I just want everybody to hear who has ever criticized the left on this issue uh, that I stand with that criticism on the left, but to think that the right has clean hands, they are in power, and their hands are covered with the blood of people who have been killed by the Islamists. <laughs> and they are using as allies people who are promoting something, uh, uh, promoting hatred, and it's not just criticism of Islam, a, a discussion of theology, or a, 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 you know, wanting to go away from Islam, but using the hatred of Islam to try and wipe Islam out of India, to say it is only a Hindu country and people can only exist there if they reconvert, uh, that's the generous offer, reconvert to be Hindus, if you're Christian, uh, uh, Buddhist, um, uh, uh, Muslim, and so on, or we'll come after you and kill you. These are the allies of governments across the world, and they are suppressing the narrative of the secularists who fought for accountability for war crimes in Bangladesh, who are fighting in the Kurdish issues, who have fought these mass struggles in favor of a rather narrow set of interests of discussing religious theology. Muslims, among the things that Muslims are not allowed to do is to fight for human rights accountability. They must only f work in the form of th uh, theological discussion. So I just leave you with uh, those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> right, um, lastly, I'm going to go to Peter Tatchell and then after that, we'll, uh, we'll open up to questions. Thank you. My starting point is that the modern movement of identity politics was very much a reaction to the failure of the left and progressive movement to deal with issues like women's rights, black rights, disabled rights, and LGBT rights. It was into that vacuum, into that neglect, that identity politics emerged. And so just to remind you, 
until the mid-1970s, much of the left, and probably most of the left, did not support LGBT rights. They said that homosexuality was a product of degenerate capitalism, that it was a bourgeois perversion, and that it would disappear under socialism. They also said that to fight for LGBT rights was a diversion from the main focus, which should be the class struggle and the struggle against imperialism. So when in 1973, I went to what was then communist East Berlin to stage a gay rights protest against communist tyranny against LGBT people, I was denounced by much of the left as a right winger and an anti-communist and that I was in the company and pay of the CIA and MI5, the American and British intelligence services. But if we look back, we can see very clearly that identity politics has made huge positive gains. It has been the self-organization of women, black and ethnic minority communities, disabled people, and the LGBT community that has powered forward advances for those peoples. And it stands in stark contrast to the relative lack of success of the broader left. So I think identity politics has, on the whole, played a very positive contribution. But, and there is a big but, sometimes it is misused. Sometimes it is used as an excuse to evade human rights issues and abuses. Um, sometimes it does result in fragmentation, in the progressive movement becoming fragmented and different communities fighting their own corner without the recognition of their common humanity and indeed their common interests in working together. It goes against the whole principle that unity is strength, that if we stand together and support each other, we are stronger and more likely to win. Um, taken to extreme, of course, identity politics leads to cultural relativism. The idea that all cultures are equally valuable, that all values are equally valuable, that there is no one better set of values than another. There are no universal values. There's no common value system for all of humanity. And that, of course, does lead to some very nasty places. I can remember some years ago, I spoke at an academic event where I was critiquing the way identity politics is sometimes misinterpreted and misused. And I said things like, freedom is better than slavery. Democracy is better than fascism. LGBT equality is better than homophobia. Rationalism, secularism, and humanism are better than religious obscurantism, ignorance, and intolerance. The upshot of that was that I was denounced by a whole section of the left for promoting Western supremacist values. <laughs> a complete betrayal of the millions of people in non-Western countries who share exactly the same values. So I support multiculturalism. I support identity politics, but with caveats. Certainly diversity, and inclusion are good, positive values. The right to be different is a fundamental human right. <clears throat> you know, the idea that we should all be the same or conformist, that is completely against humanitarian and human rights values. But the right to be different should only apply providing it does not involve the diminution of the rights and freedoms of others. So to give you an example of how identity politics and multiculturalism can be perverted, um, about two decades ago, with the LGBT group Outrage, I was involved in a campaign against eight Jamaican reggae singers 
who were advocating the murder of LGBT people. Acting in response to appeals from Jamaican LGBT and human rights defenders to challenge these musicians, we launched a campaign against them to try and get them to change their stance. When they wouldn't, we organized a global boycott campaign to cancel their concerts because we believe that incitement to murder is and was a criminal offense and that incitement to murder is an abuse of free speech. We were denounced by many on the left as promoting a racist campaign. And I am still attacked even to this day, two decades later, as that well-known racist, Peter Tatchell, who has produced a racist campaign against Jamaican people. Not even against Jamaican singers, not even against eight singers, but against the whole of Jamaican people. <laughs> it just shows how badly wrong multiculturalism and identity politics can sometimes go. Um, I think that the principle of human rights as a universal principle is absolutely vital to defend the human rights of people everywhere and to unite us all in our common humanity, to work together to, yes, fight our own corner, but also fight our common corner to ensure the betterment of all of us. But of course, when you say this, some on the left will say, well, human rights, that's a Western concept. And I've been denounced many times for promoting the Western Eurocentric view of human rights as a universal principle. But of course, that is a total misreading of history and the truth. You can trace back some of the earliest embryonic ideas of human rights to Ashoka in ancient India and to Cyrus the Great in ancient Persia. Some of their ideas were the antecedents, the embryos of what we now know as human rights. And moreover, the great highlight of human rights principles, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was not drawn up by Westerners, it was drawn up by people from all continents and cultures. And I ask you and invite you to look at the particular contributions of the Egyptian and Indian delegates to input, what they inputted into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Really important contributions. So universal human rights are what bind us together. Without asserting our common humanity, we cannot conquer our common problems. We cannot secure human rights and social justice for everyone on this planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I've been absolutely uh, awestruck and so impressed by every single one of our panel members, and I've learned a lot. I would like to open it up now to questions. Um, so if, and my eyesight's not so good, so if you can help me. Um, if you have any questions, yep. Uh, there's someone over there. Thanks so much, that was fabulous, really fabulous. Um, I have a question for Gita. Um, you're right when you say it doesn't seem to matter who's in power, the left or the right. They all seem to reach out to Islamists and empower them and, and elevate them to... to um... I can't hear very well. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I think you're right when you say it doesn't matter who's in power, the left or the right in government. They all seem to want to reach out to Islamists. Um, and I'm not sure where this problem lies, but I think that it might be with, the problem might lie with the deep state, by which I mean the spy agencies and the police intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Whoever's in power gets, you know, briefings from them and they don't make it all public, obviously. Um, but they seem to always be so desperate to outreach to Islamists that they're disempowering the secularists and the progressive Muslim voices. So another, I, I was just wondering what you think we can do about that. and. That there's a corollary to that, which is that the government has also outsourced censorship, and that's part of the problem with media self-censoring. Um, they basically don't have to censor us anymore because we censor ourselves in the media. So I, I just wonder what you think we can do about this. 
Well, I mean, all our work is precisely challenging these sorts of things. I don't think it's just the deep state. I mean, I, I certainly think the security concerns and what the security agencies are privately saying uh, have something to do with it. Um, but it's an interesting thing that Britain is, in terms of its society, is one, one of the most irreligious societies in the world, uh, but it is a Christian state. And the fact that it's a Christian state drives uh, several things. One is that, um, and, and one of the things we've always said, as one of the founders of Women Against Fundamentalism, and I'm sure Peter and others here on the panel would share this position, that we've <coughs> argued for the disestablishment of the Church of England, that Britain actually should become a formally secular state, not just a largely um, uh, secular society. Uh, what's happened is that the, 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 it's not only the minorities that have argued for their rights. The Archbishop of Canterbury, when he was facing a backlash from uh, within his church, because there were arguments for um, women bishops, uh, gay bishops, uh, you know, gay men to be able to be bishops or to, you know, serve in the ministry, uh, marriage in, uh, uh, in the church and things like that. He was facing a huge backlash from other Anglicans who were religious fundamentalists, for instance, particularly from Nigeria, but also within Britain. I think that he, he began to endorse Sharia law in Britain and other laws that are higher than God's law. Uh, I mean, higher than the state law, that God's law was higher than state law. I think he used Sharia as a kind of stalking horse to deal with the arguments within his own church and the fact that he was facing this backlash and he was trying to balance, and you can't always balance completely opposite claims, and the Church of England has really got itself, I think, into a mess trying to do that. When the government uh, went for marriage equality, uh, decided that they would vote for marriage equality, and this was a conservative government, they exempted the Church of England uh, from being able to perform single-sex weddings. Is this correct? I'm getting that right, yes? Now, I think this is one of the most disgraceful things that they did, because the only time I think a state should really interfere with a church is if it's an established church, in which case it ought to be forced to follow all of state law. You know, I mean, if you're disestablishing the church, you're actually going, uh, uh, saying that you're given a greater measure of freedom in how you progress your theology or not. But if you're part of the state, funded by the state, uh, you know, you should follow state law. And it meant that even vicars who wanted to perform single-sex weddings, and everybody knows there are huge numbers of gay vicars, I mean, many of them are now out, uh, but at one time they were all concealed, um, and they wanted to do this, they're not allowed to do it by the diktat of the state that is trying to manage its relationship with its own Christian fundamentalists. So the promotion of Sharia law is not only appeasing Muslims, uh, uh, or Muslim fundamentalists, uh, where, where they think they're managing the Muslim community by allying with some of the worst in order to control the, the ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so on. Um, but that leads them to actually ally with bits of Al-Qaeda and so on <laughs> instead. So it, but it isn't just the deep state, it's very much the overt state. Yesterday we heard about the faith schools agenda, uh, they, they, they march hand in hand with, with shrinking the state. So many, many services are being uh, uh, put out. And even Michael Gove, a man who was a sort of neocon when he was education secretary, now he hates the Muslim Brotherhood. He did try and argue for it, but he's a political idiot in many ways, and, and being toxic in many other ways to do with Brexit and so on. Even when he had the power as educational secretary, he did beef up Ofsted, that's the regulatory body's ability to investigate extremism in schools. So he did that. At the same time, as he was allowing more faith schools, including more Muslim faith schools, to be set up. And only today we're seeing in the, in, in the, in the paper that the government may, may have to roll back on this policy of having more faith schools because it has come out in shreds because they cannot promote more faith schools and talk about social cohesion. It's a basic, you know, it should be a complete no-brainer. And so finally they're saying, okay, maybe we won't, but now their education policy is in a mess because they've abandoned the public funding of schools and the public accountability under local councils that there was. So to try and fix one problem, the conservatives have created 50 more problems, and I can't see many of the people campaigning against the left alliance with fundamentalists who are willing to, except people on this panel, who are willing to raise this issue, and that's why I'm putting it before <coughs> you, because this is what governments in other countries are doing as well as they try and shrink the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, uh, a question over there from someone I know. <laughs> and uh, if you don't mind, can we um, just have one person answer so we can get as many um, yes. of the audience as possible? <coughs> um, hi, thank you very much for that, the brilliant panel, um, as has been all the panels. I wanted to ask two questions, uh, one from, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, Keenan and the other from Zainab. One is on the issue of identity politics. Uh, Peter mentioned that identity politics can be sometimes positive, and I think there's a difference between that identity politics that uh, Peter is talking about, which was based around political ideals, versus identity politics today, which is based on race and ethnicity, and is devoid of any sort of political, uh, you know, uh, inspiration and, and uh, thing. And I think Keenan's written a lot about that, so I'd like to get your comments on that, Keenan. Uh, on Zainab, I'd like to ask you to comment on discussions we've had earlier about uh, Islam not having, for example, apostasy within the Quran, and that uh, Islam is very different and what ISIS or what the Iranian regime or what the Saudi regime is practicing is not real Islam. So I'd like your views on that, as well as views on Islamic reform, uh, the reform of Islam, that movement that's taking place, as well as Islamic feminism. Thank you. Okay. Can I would you like to take the first? One? Sure. Um, I take a much harder line in opposition to identity politics than Peter does. Um, I think there's a distinction we need to draw between equal rights and the idea that values uh, derive in some, some sense from one's identity. Um, I think they're two fundamentally different views. I accept, and, and I made the point that in the, the post-war world, particularly from the 60s on, the, um, the origins of identity politics derive from the failure of the, sorry, can you hear me? Um, from the failure of the left to take seriously questions of oppression, of women's rights, of racism, and so on. And that those struggles that de developed out of that for gay rights, for women's rights, for black rights, and so on, um, were positive. But in a sense, the struggle for black rights wasn't a struggle for black rights. It was a struggle for equal rights. That is, for black people to be treated equally with everyone else. It wasn't a struggle for a specific form of rights for black people or a specific set of... or a, or a specific um, set of values or ideals or ways of looking about the world or culture that, that only uh, belonged to black people. It's the same with women's rights and gay rights uh, and, and so on. And part of the problem is that over the past 20, 30, 40 years, the idea of equal rights has dissolved into the idea of different rights for different groups uh, and that different groups, because they are different, have a different view of the world, have a different uh, a set of values, have a different set of ideals. That is what identity politics is today, and that is why it seems to me that um, I am fundamentally opposed to it. And the roots of that idea, as I said, go back to the reactionary notions the, um, of uh, racism from the late 18th century, derived in opposition to, um, uh, to uh, enlightenment ideas about universal rights. There was a, um, a French art reactionary, Joseph de Maistre, you may, you may have heard this quote of his, who in opposition uh, to the notion of the rights of man as promulgated by the French Revolution, said, I have seen Russians, I have seen Frenchmen, I have seen Englishmen, I have never seen man, and therefore there is no such thing as the rights of man. In other words, it's a way of attacking universal rights. We wouldn't talk about rights of man these days, we'd talk about universal rights, but that's what it refers to. And therefore I think it is important if we are um, defending universal rights and values um, that we take a strong line and a strong opposition 
uh, to identity politics. Thanks, Kenan. Um, to answer the question uh, about reform, um, I would just like to say, um, and I want to tie this in with the identity politics, my, I mean, I'm a Muslim. I, I identify as an agnostic Muslim. Um, I used to be a very traditional Muslim for most of my life. I'm 58 years old, so for half a century I was pretty much a traditional Muslim. I worked in a Muslim school. Um, and then I went through a period of doubt and I lost my faith and I, that was when I got to know Mariam and the rest. Um, and I identified as an ex-Muslim. Although actually, personally, I don't think people actually change that much. I mean, I was never an extremist when I was a Muslim. I was the same guy you, uh, you, see, you see now. Um, but I identified as an ex-Muslim. Um, but I still had family and friends and community who were all Muslims. I actually do believe in something, and I call it God. Um, I find comfort in prayer. Um, I enjoy many of the Islamic traditions. Um, and I just started you know, uh, picking and choosing. You know, um, the bits that are rubbish are, uh, I throw out and the bits that I like I keep. And I started thinking, well, you know, um, identifying as an ex-Muslim, you know, I mean, labels can be useful. Um, it's important to see the person, the human being behind a label, but sometimes labels can be very useful. And I, I recognize the importance of the ex-Muslim label. Most ex-Muslims probably don't want to be called ex-Muslims, but it's a useful label to help break the taboo on leaving Islam. And I recognize that, and I, and I was very proud to be part of that movement. Um, I, but eventually, I, um, I felt, you know, sort of, I, I didn't want to keep being called about what I was kind of thing, but, and, and actually I still was very much within the Islamic circle, and I, I used to, I, I attend the inclusive mosque, which um, has gay and um, uh, uh, lesbian imams and so on. And so I, I thought, look, in, in many, in all intents and purposes, I'm still very much Muslim. It's been part of my life. I've, I've studied the Quran all my life. I speak <coughs> Arabic. I, I spent so much of my life, you know, with, you know, within the community. I enjoy, I enjoy fasting sometimes, <laughs> um, not so much in these long summers, but um, and I enjoy praying. And it's my connection to this something that I call God. I'm agnostic, fundamentally agnostic, but um, agnosticism means I don't know there's a God. I think in that way we're all agnostic. Many of you are agnostic atheists, some, I, I, I presume. Um, but I am, um, so I thought, no, I'm, I'm Muslim. And why should I accept this um, binary um, uh, um, sort of a definition that the fundamentalists want? They want um, uh, people like me to leave Islam because they want to keep the control and, keep, and keep the monopoly. Um, it's all or nothing. You either, you know, accept everything or you're, or you're out. Well, in a way, I decided that, yeah, I'm going to use a little bit of identity politics and uh, I'm going to define myself as agnostic Muslim and um, sort of change people's perception and, and make them think about the person behind that label. Um, number one, it really pisses off the Islamists that I call myself um, a Muslim and I, and I hold views like I believe the Quran is a human uh, um, uh, do, um, document. It's flawed and uh, Muhammad is far from a perfect human being. Um, all um, holy books are human, man-made um, by people a long time ago um, in superstitious times. They're full of myths and fairy tales. They have some nice bits, you know. Um, they're not original. They're, you know, they came from humanity as they evolved. Um, but I'm, I'm quite comfortable with just picking and choosing the nice bits, which I have done for, you know, over half a century. And so back to reform. Now, I respect people like Annie, who was on earlier, um, and I respect all the progressive and liberal Muslims, but I don't think trying to make theological workarounds um, is the way to reform Islam, because with, with, with all due respect, it's, it's, it's delusional and it's sometimes disingenuous. Um, I mean, for example, um, and I discussed this with Annie, and, and she's my friend, and I, and I do respect her, and I love her very much. Um, <laughs> But, um, for example, the, the verse in the Quran which says uh, that a man can hit his wife, um, verse uh, 34 of Surah Nisa, um, uh, uh, and so, um, um, that, means, that means that, uh, you know, uh, those women who you fear disloyalty, um, whatever that means, the shoes. Um, these days they say it's adultery, but um, actually there's a separate punishment for adultery. Um, uh, uh, first speak to them and then separate in beds and then hit them. 
Now, I know Annie has a very strong view about that, and she's very adamant that it doesn't say that, and it really doesn't say that. But to come back to that, that debate earlier, um, I agreed very much with um, um, Halima and um, uh, the, other, the, other, the other sister, I can't remember her name, um, uh, <coughs> that, you know, uh, look, there are lots of Islams, um, but mainstream Islam is very traditional and accepts hadith and accepts all those things. And, and while I, I support um, progressives for having their own uh, interpretations, I think if we're going to have reform, the, in fact, I think it's the only way to have reform is to be honest that the Quran is a flawed human document. Can we have any more okay. questions? Uh, actually, Mariam sorry. asked me a question. No, no, I'm sorry. If I'm I sorry. still have time sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, um, thank you, Mariam, for that question, because it, it, um, it comes to a very important point. You know, every time something happens, terrorist attack or anything, you, you, you always hear this sentence, this is not the real Islam. This is not the real Islam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, I would like those people who say that to show us where is the real Islam, <laughs> to give us an example. I tell you. <laughs> yeah. Is there a place in the world, an experience uh, in history, uh, something that we can call, we can just, you know, be, uh, agree that this is the real Islam? Yeah, actually, I was asking myself about that, that question, you know, is Saudi Arabia the real Islam? Is it Iran? Is it um, North Africa, but where you can drink your beer, but actually you're not sure if uh, you, you will be arrested or no? Um, you know, uh, where you can do things, but they are hidden. You know, I, I, I just was asking myself, where, what is the real Islam? Is it the the Muslim friend of the French leftists who say, no, this is not the real Islam. You know, I have a Muslim friend who drinks. Um, where is this real Islam? And actually, I think that if we want um, to, to identify real Islam, for me, there is no real Islam. There is Muslims. And there is good Muslims. I mean, people who are, um, uh, who are good people who can't commit crimes, and I think this is owed to them, to their education and humanity. And there is also um, Muslims who apply Islam um, like it is uh, as they read it. And actually, th this brings us to another problem, the problem of interpretation. Why Islam, why the hell is it the only book that no one can really interpret since 15 centuries. Okay, so I'll try to answer. First of all, I think that everyone, every historian can agree that Islam is a religion written in a Bedouin context 15 centuries ago. So uh, in Islam, you have a lot of rules, medical rules, hygiene rules, war rules, economic rules, social rules, legal rules, all those rules actually, they was written in, in that context in the 50, 15 centuries ago in a Bedouin context. And, uh, you know, actually there is a lot to say about this question, but the only thing I can say is that when I see uh, today, for instance, what the guys of ISIS do, it is the strict application of what was written in the Islamic texts at the time, not only in the Quran, but also in the Sunnah. Of course, in the Sunni Islam, there is five different sources of jurisdiction. You, you first, if you don't find your answer in the Quran, you, you, you look for it in the Sunnah. If you don't find it in the Sunnah, you check in the... Um, uh, um, you have the Sunnah, then you have the Ijma, then you have the, the, the Ijtihad. No, the Ijtihad is the last one. You have Sunnah and, and Ijma and Qiyas and then Ijma. Ijma is the, 
uh, consensus of the ulama. The qiyas is the comparison. For instance, let's say we're asking ourselves, uh, is Facebook halal or haram? So we try to find something similar to, yeah, because this is actually, this is the level, this is the, the this is what is going in the Islamic debate. It's only is, well, should I wash, uh, um, sorry, should I make my ab ablutions with the right left hand? Uh, should I wash my first feet, my left feet? Because this was actually the Bedouin context at the time. So those who pretend now that Islam is a religion of peace and love, blah, 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 blah. Personally, <laughs> actually, I say, you, you stop lying. You, you can read Quran. You know? yeah. Hassan, yeah. Hassan, Hassan gave an example of the verses uh, from Surah Nisa. When you, you have written, hit them, it's hit them. I don't know how you can interpret it differently. When you have the verses 29 of Surah, uh, um, uh, Surah Tawbah, uh, uh, combat, you know, fight those who don't believe in God and among Muslims, among Christians and Jews. I mean, it's clear. So, um, anyway, I, I see that we still have only two minutes. So I'll be, I will, I will speak this afternoon. I, I, I will be speaking at 6.30 and I will uh, answer that question. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zainab. Um, Gon, I wanted to quickly come back on, on, this, on this as well. Um, is that my two minutes then? Uh, um, is this my what, no, what we'll do minutes? is if you want to say this and then we'll... And then we'll then it's okay. I'll, I'll just... Whenever you give me my two minutes, it's fine. Um, actually, because we're, we're, we're going to finish now. I'm concluding <laughs> remarks, yeah. Okay. So, um, if you want... Yeah, so we'll start um, from... Can I... Where would, would you like to start? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, okay. I'm a, I'm a great chair, aren't I? Okay, uh, well, there is so much to be said here, but I just, do, I just wanted to make two points. One is about the left and right, and one, of, one is about the west and east. So basically, um, what I talked about, I talked about the identity politics in the Middle East. And um, I could give you every, every version of Islam that is possible from the Middle East. Every version, from the very progressive, very moderate, to the very uh, fundamental, to ISIS, to Saudi Arabia, and all that. Um, they all agree at the end. And we need to understand this. When religion has power somewhere, it could be used as a political tool. And it's a big problem for us, believe me. Um, they all agree to be anti-gay, to be homophobic. If you go into any groups of Muslim people in the whole Middle East, I guarantee you, you don't find five people don't agree on being homophobic. You don't. Um, think about women's rights, equalities. Let's say women's freedom. Go, don't say women's rights, please. If you talk, say women's freedom. And you will see, oh, no freedom. So you see what I mean? So Sharia law is the ambition for the most progressive. We have to understand this. And I'm talking again, I'm not talking about individual, very beautiful human beings, Muslim people. I'm talking about Islam in power, religion in power, in politics. And in the Middle East, that's what I really wanted to highlight. That's what's happening. Different versions of Islam are fighting over political and economic power. And as a secularist and atheist, we are up against such a big, big issue. And there is so many of them and so little of us, I have to say. So that's, that's, my, that's my first point. My second, uh, sorry, it's going to be... No, it's okay, carry on, carry on. Um, <coughs> you see, the identity politics, as Peter uh, 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 talked about it, it could work very, very well. And I did say that, that it works well in Europe, in the West, because we do have constitution, institutions, we have law, we have, you know, there is accountability for people's rights here. 
However, if you talk about the place, again, when I come from, there is no accountability by the governments. There is no accountability by the law. There is militias most of the place. In Syria, in Iraq, you see militias controlling everything. Um, uh, uh, Kenan uh, uh, talked about the keep gatekeepers of identity. I, creating different and div divided identities has become an industry in Iraq and in Syria. It works in the political and economical equation very, very well. It brings interest. It, it drives the oil um, trade very well. And these are, these are the issues we are facing. However, um, sorry, in the left, um, Peter, I have to say I kind of disagree in terms of, I know you have suffered a lot from the left, but left is not one thing, it's not one version, as everything else. I mean, I have been a communist, a socialist, a left person all my life, as much as I remember. I don't see no problem, never ever, in defending women's rights, um, LGBT rights, and I see it as my thing. I have to do it because at the end, I mean, a person who's a left and Marxist should be for full equality uh, of all people, economic equality, legal equality, all kinds of equalities. And you have to be a believer in equality for everyone. And I am as a left person, and I'm sure there are many, many people in the left who are, who are of the same belief. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I don't mind. Yeah, you, you can ask. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, uh, let me talk about identity politics and what, what, why I am fundamentally critical of it, but actually not talking about identity politics, but talking about something else that's been raised, which is that of multiculturalism. Now, I have been a crit critic of multiculturalism for as long as I can remember, from long before it became fashionable uh, to be so. But when you say to people, I'm a critic of multiculturalism, they usually think you're a critic of immigration. I'm not. I am for, in fact, freedom of movement. Um, I'm a fundamentalist when it comes to immigration, just as I am with a lot of other things. So how do I square that? Well, I think that there's a distinction we, we need to draw between multiculturalism as a set of policies and diversity as lived experience. I'm all for diversity as lived experience, the experience of living in societies which are uh, a cosmopolitan, broad, open, uh, with a variety of different views, beliefs, attitudes, lifestyles. The trouble with multiculturalism is that it undermines just about everything that's good about diversity. So what's good about diversity is that we can have a debate. We can engage with each other. We, we, we can judge each other. We, we can um, uh, 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 contest our different values and, 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 and so on. The trouble with multiculturalism is that it puts people into boxes. It's a set of policies which says, you are black, you are Muslim, you are Gujarati, whatever, and defines public policy according to the boxes into which you have been put. That, it seems... And what multiculturalism has done is actually given an institutional form to identity politics. That's why I oppose it. That's why I oppose I'm for diversity. I am for immigration. I'm opposed to multiculturalism. I'm opposed to identity politics. Finally, just finally, this is thing about um, difference. I think the right to be different is good, but th th there's a difference between the, f the fact that in private life, we, people should have perfect right to believe what they want, to do what they want, so long as it doesn't um, uh, 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 inflict upon the, uh, 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 the rights of others. And in public life, that you should be treated equally despite your differences. I think there's a, there's a, there's a distinction we need to draw between having the right to be different in, 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 pub, in private life and the treatment of uh, all people as equals, despite their differences of uh, colour, of race, of ethnicity, of uh, culture, of religion. Trouble is, we do the opposite. We institutionalise differences in public life, and public life and, and uh, 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 policies are 
um, shaped according to one's identities. That's what we need to oppose. We need to defend diversity, oppose the politics of identity. Would you like to come back, Peter? Just to come back on a couple of points, I mean, I think I did say very clearly some of the left or much of the left. I, I wasn't damning all the left because I know there are many people on the left and the wider progressive movement <coughs> who have taken the right stand to defend universal human rights. I want to go back to slightly disagree with Kenan over some of his remarks earlier. He seemed to be saying that identity politics was about the struggle for equality which in many respects it was. But if you look at the radical women's liberation critique, it was about much more than equality. It was a radical critique of masculinity, of male-female relations. And the same with the gay liberation critique of homophobia and heterosexism in the 1960s and 1970s. It was about more than equal rights. It was about a critique of gender, and sexuality, which is still playing out today. So I think, you know, we should not simply reduce this issue of identity politics to mere equal rights. On the point about reforming Islam, well, of course, there are many different arguments and many different approaches. I think they're all valid. And I think in the work that my foundation has done with our LGBT Muslim solidarity campaign, we have actually secured quite a lot of changes and success. A long, long way to go yet. But we're trying to say that the LGBT and Muslim communities share a common experience of prejudice, discrimination, and hate crime. And therefore, whatever our differences, we should strive to work together to tackle all the hate that divides us. And that means solidarity against homophobia within the Muslim community, and against anti-Muslim prejudice within the LGBT community. Now, we have actually got quite a lot of people who are previously very hostile to come on board using those kind of arguments. Likewise, taking a theological stance, uh, we very much argue that in fact, in the Quran, there are no explicit condemnations of homosexuality and certainly no punishments prescribed. So we're challenging the orthodoxy and again, we are finding that many Muslim people, first of all, they're very resistant, but when we tell them to go away and show us the evidence, they come up back with a lot of ambiguous quotations from the Quran, but nothing that's really explicit. And they completely, of course, misread the story uh, of Lut. Completely misread the story of Lut. So I think our approach is not the only approach, but I know from our own experience, we are using those strategies changing some Muslim hearts and minds. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Can I have very brief uh, finishing remarks? Peter, would you like to, to go next? Very quickly. Um, <clears throat> very hard when finishing remarks also open up a huge space. There are, I, I have to say, the people who are founding their, their struggles uh, on... I, I, I will agree with much that various people have said, and... I certainly agree with Peter that the struggle for around various issues that could be classified as identity politics were for a larger universalism. They were, they, they were for transforming the understanding of societies as they were, so they were transformative struggles uh, of how societies should be. Um, but I think what distinguishes them from the narrow kind of identity politics is it, it was transforming the notion of universalism rather than attacking the principle of universalism. I think that's a very crucial difference. But in many countries, including Muslim majority countries and Islamic states, and I'm talking about Iran and Pakistan and so on, it's those very people that will say, don't go down this reinterpretation route because you'll never win against the mullahs. Firmly cite your arguments within universal human rights principles, within CEDAW, the ICCPR, etc. When Iranian women within Iran decided to um, challenge family law and so on, they didn't say we want better rights under shir Sharia. They said we want equality in family laws. And they you know, started a, a grassroots movement going from place to place and getting signatures in marketplaces and things like that. And so 
you know, there's there's a whole range of opinions in Iran, but I find the people promoting the religious uh, interpretation views are sitting in Western universities. You know, they're not sitting inside Iran largely, and uh, the and, and similar with Pakistan. The Pakistani feminists went through a period in the early 90s when they were first facing the backlash of fundamentalism growing and so on. Let's read the Quran. Let's find different ways of arguing and so on. They did that. Maybe they still use it sometimes, but it's not their primary tool. They need the backing of international solidarity movements. They need the backing of other movements within their country. They need to challenge. Uh, blasphemy laws, apostasy laws, uh, as well as working on violence against women and so on. And m- mostly, you cannot do it within the framework of Islam, because what you are having, and I think this is one reason why Annie mentioned that in Morocco, I'd be interested to know, I think the reason why some clerics have come out against apostasy laws is that they've gone so mad that Muslims are apostatizing other Muslims. I don't think that that declaration will really defend apostates. I really challenge whether it would actually defend people who actually leave Islam. And just to go to what Zainab said, what she said will happen in the future is happening here in Britain, where where the East London Mosque, which has one after another homophobic preachers, is saying, we've condemned homophobia. So to allow them to condemn homophobia, uh, to uh, you know, just make generalized statements, but without seeing what they're actually doing, it's precisely they evacuate the meaning, they stand, and they use that as their shield when you actually challenge them for accountability. And you'll hear more about this in the next session. And last but not least, um, Zainab. Now, I'll be speaking enough this afternoon, so I will just uh, yeah, m- make some comments. It's just also like condemning terrorism or Islamic feminism or a lot of notions that we should, we have to talk about. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan and, and the panel. We're just going to break for lunch. Please come back uh, five minutes to three o'clock. Uh, we have two important panel one on out loud and proud and another one on art and resistance. Enjoy your lunch.